When we're talking about an organization's culture, part of the discussion that we had was focused on the function of culture to help people understand what it means to work in the organization and to build continuity over time and personnel changes. What we're talking about is really how people are socialized into the organization. We often think and hear about socialization in terms of childhood development, how we learn right from wrong, good from bad, and so on. In an organizational setting, however, socialization refers to the process where employees acquire social knowledge and skills so that they can assume their organizational roles. Now, notice this is about social knowledge and skills, not functional knowledge. Really, we're hired into organizations because we should be able to do our job. However, our experience in the organization will largely depend on how we're able to maneuver the environment. This is really what I'm talking about with socialization. There are both formal and informal ways that people are socialized into organizations, and we'll go through that process, but think about it this way. You were accepted into the course because you met the requirements and were judged likely to be successful in it. So when you came to the university, you had an induction process where you're told about the course, introduced very briefly to the staff who'd be teaching you while you're here, and you received a shed load of information all at once. Then as you began the first semester, you start to figure out what it really means to be at university and more specifically at this university. Now, no doubt you've talked to your friends that have gone to other universities, you compare notes, and what you'll find is that by the time you graduate, you'll really understand what it means to have been a student here. But these early experiences are about how you're being socialized into the experience and to this university much more specifically. A critical part of socialization is better understanding how we are meant to execute our roles within our organization. But there are different types of roles that we can take on. Think of our roles as any behavior expected based on the specific functions of our position within the organization. But there are three dimensions to anyone's role within any organization. The first is the inclusionary or the social dimension, and this focuses on the degree to which we both immerse ourselves with our colleagues and create opportunities for newcomers to be included within the group. This is an important role in creating a positive, supportive, and functional organizational culture. The second, the functional role, addresses the specific and defined tasks that we're actually meant to accomplish, our day-to-day -day work. Naturally, this is what we're directly employed for and what keeps us in our positions. Then finally are the hierarchical roles that we may occupy. These can be formal like our rank, so they can be tied to our functional roles, but these hierarchical roles can also be less formal and connected to our influence. So for example, someone can be an opinion leader in mission critical without ever occupying a specific job that gives them power. The process of socialization focuses on how we settle in and really come to understand all of the types of dimensions and the roles that we can serve. So let's take a closer look at the process. The first stage in the socialization process is anticipatory socialization. This happens after we know we're going to be joining an organization, but before we actually ever start. So if you can think of the induction materials that you might have been sent ahead of coming to university, and often this will involve our job description in normal work circumstances, packets of information, contracts, human resources, all of this kind of stuff that goes on before day one. Now, what's important at the anticipatory socialization stage is both realism in what we're supposed to be doing and congruence with what we are expecting to do. So this entails three components. The first is anticipating the realities about both the organization and the job. If we better understand what the organization is about, so we have the opportunity to talk with current employees, um, our new boss, things like that, we can get a sense of what the organization and really our job role is before we even start. This increases most typically our level of satisfaction before we ever begin the job and we're ready and, and prepared really to get into the organization. 
The second component to this realism and congruence is anticipating the organization's need for our particular skills and abilities. So it's understanding our place within the organization, what it is that we are meant to be contributing. I've known people who have accepted new jobs, they've had the job description, but once they get into the job, the what they're supposed to be doing ends up being a little bit different than the, what was advertised. This creates discontinuity and, and levels of frustration. So it's really important ahead of time that we know and have a realistic picture of what we're going to be expected to do. And if we have to skill up within the job, how we're going to be supported in doing that. And then the third component of this is anticipating the organization's sensitivities to our needs and our values. So this is very much about trying to figure out how the organization and the degree to which the organization is interested in accommodating what matters to us. So some sources of conflict can certainly be religious, ethnic identity can be um, also related to relative levels of ability, different gender kinds of issues. So whatever it is that that might be affecting our experience in the workplace, to what degree is the organization sensitive to those needs? Now, if you know that the organization is not worried one way or another, that they just expect you to come to work to cope with it, and they'll make legal accommodations for whatever you might need, then that's very different than if you know that the organization is going to work with people who might have different issues that, that come up in their regular lives. So for example, when I was in Germany, one of the interesting things was that family status was actually something that you disclosed in your application if you had kids or not. Some workplaces were quite happy to be flexible about childcare and flexible work schedules around that, and some weren't. But this is an important thing that you would want to know ahead of time. And so what is the organization's sensitivities to your particular needs and values? The second stage of the socialization process is the encounter stage. So we've actually started work or started at a new organization. And this is the point at which we start to learn what the organization's really like. Was there congruence with all those values, skills, and attitudes that we had coming into it? Are our expectations being met? So as we develop our first encounters, one of the critical components that we start to figure out are the job demands. So we look at the tasks, the roles, and the interpersonal demands on our time, and we start to deal with different types of potential areas of conflict. So several types of conflict can emerge at this stage of the socialization process. The first is managing life versus work conflicts. When we start jobs, it's a lot of energy and, and quite honestly, in your first six to 12 months in a new job, you will be really focused in most cases on that job. It's easy to let the work-life balance get out of kilter. So this can create some conflicts and some frustrations. This is particularly true if you have a partner or if you have family concerns. You know, in my case, I have doggy concerns. So if you're spending a lot of time really focused on the new job, this can actually become quite a critical challenge. The second potential conflict that emerges are intergroup conflicts. So this is the politics of an organization. You know, how does your work group work together? And how does your work group relate to the other work groups within your organization? What are the nature of the relationships between groups? And how does your, wherever you're working, how do you fit within that organization? This is something that comes in very quickly as people start to learn the lay of the land. So part of the challenge in these early stages is that we're often seeking clarification about our roles, the definition, and, and really what it entails on a day-to-day -day basis. It's one thing to have a list of expectations and to have a, a job listing and a job specification. 
And then you get into the day to day and you may be looking at the day to day and wondering how does this fit? So early on in those early encounters, part of it is a lot of times clarifying what proportion of your time should be balanced in what ways. And then of course, as you're figuring out the job demands and as the key element of the encounter phase, you're becoming familiar with the tasks and the group dynamics. Now, this paints probably a more ominous picture in the encounter stage, but this is really where people start to set the tone for their expectations within their organization. So it's important both on the organization's part and the employee's part to make sure that there's an, as much support, transparency, and communication as possible in order to smooth those first encounters. And it's equally important when organizations hire employees, they're investing time and resources into that employee. Likewise, it's obviously important for the employee to fit within the organization. So organizations that take time to help get people up to speed with how things are done in the organization, both formally and informally, as well as an employee's willingness to sort of jump right in and figure out how to balance everything out is vitally important throughout the socialization process. In the third stage of the socialization process, you're no longer a newcomer. You have figured out what you're meant to be doing, you've adjusted to the organization, and so the third stage is really about change and acquisition. You've adjusted to what the organization is, and so this is focused on mastery. And what I mean is mastery of your role and mastery of the organizational environment. So there are three elements to this, this stage in the process. First is that any competing role demands should be resolved at this point. If you felt like you're being pulled by work life, family life, social life, once you get to the change and acquisition stage, those kinds of issues should be rebalanced. So you've figured out what you need, you've talked to your boss, you've talked to your family, you have it all sorted out. You're now in a state where you're pretty happy with the balance between what your expectations are on a day-to-day -day basis and also how that influences the rest of your life. Second, that also means that the critical tasks are mastered. What's expected to you on a day-to-day -day basis isn't new, it isn't surprising. You've done it, you know where the paperwork is, you know how to do everything that you're meant to do on a regular basis. So the expectation is that you become quicker. And then the third component of this is that group norms and values are internalized, meaning you understand where people are coming from, you've gotten into the routine of working with the particular people, the processes, the routines, and the expectations. So in all, this stage, the change in acquisition stage, means that you've adapted to the organization and where needed, the organization and your work group have adapted to you. You know what to expect on a regular basis and you carry on with the day-to-day -day working. The functional reason to move through the socialization process is to get to positive outcomes, both for the organization as well as the employee. When an employee moves effectively through the three stages of socialization, from anticipatory socialization to successful initial encounters and into the change and acquisition stages, then we would expect two types of positive outcomes, behavioral and effective. So think of it this way, if we have a realistic view of the organization that we're coming into, we see the congruence in our personal or our professional objectives and the work in, that the organization does, then we can start and we can focus on better understanding the job demands, how we fit in, and how we work with our colleagues. That moves us to settling into the organization more effectively, and that's where we get to the so what. Why does any of this matter? And why should organizations invest resources in it? And that's where the outcomes come in. So if we first look at the behavioral outcomes, there are three behavioral outcomes of an effective socialization process. The first is role effectiveness. Very simply, we're able to perform our job functions to our own 
and to our organization's satisfaction. Second, if we are effectively socialized into the organization and feel like there's a genuine congruence between the organization our, and our own priorities, then we're much more likely to intend to remain with the organization for some time. It means we're focused on the organization and our work. No distractions, or at least fewer distractions. Third, because we're focused on our roles and remaining, it leads to improved innovation in our job functions and also improved cooperation with our colleagues. Not surprisingly, these behavioral outcomes are appealing to organizations because it means less employee turnover and better productivity. So investment in a good institutional socialization process provides a strong return on investment for organizations. These behavioral outcomes are also good, of course, for the employees because we're getting a great experience and probably enjoying our work environment while we're making meaningful contributions and advancing our own careers. On the other side of this, we also focus on employees' feelings, the effective outcomes, and this is also vital for both employees and the organization. So a strong and positive socialization process leads to three effective or emotion-based outcomes as well. First, it improves our job satisfaction. As we're going to discuss throughout the semester, job satisfaction is a fundamental requirement for an organization to work well and for employee retention and effectiveness. When we are not satisfied, we're just probably not going to remain in the position for very long. Second, it improves motivation. We'll talk about several different types of motivation throughout the semester, but in general, a successful socialization program leads to a feeling of positivity when people come to work. That means we work harder, we're more engaged, and our days go by quicker. Third, it improves our overall involvement. We're more likely to volunteer for new tasks, participate in leadership and decision making, and engage with our colleagues and managers at multiple levels. So there's a huge body of research indicating that involvement drives an organization success, especially through difficult times. So when the well of motivation and involvement runs dry in organizations, people disengage and the organizations flounder. So at the outset, when someone comes into the organization it can really help to set itself up to be successful by catching the new employees and engaging them effectively, making them feel welcome, a part of the team, and making that team notion matter to folks. So there we have it, simple, right? All we need to do is make sure that everyone's socialized well and everything's great. Well, obviously there's a little bit more to it. What we're gonna focus on now is the context for socialization, newcomer needs, and approaches to socialization so that we can better understand what it means for both an organization and a newcomer to have this positive socialization experience that I'm talking about. There are three contexts in which socialization happens. You can think of these as the different settings. The first of these is the formal and the informal. Like I alluded to earlier, there's a lot that will go on that is officially organization sponsored, that the organization do in terms of building programs. But a lot of what happens to make employees feel welcome and included is informal. And there are responsibilities that both are incumbent upon the organization, its members, i.e. your other team members, as well as the newcomer. So in the formal process, we'll talk about that, and we've talked about that in terms of the programs and options. We'll talk about that more later. But I do want to focus on the informal. One of the mistakes that a lot of newcomers make in organizations is not jumping into the social opportunities and not jumping into the opportunities to get to know their, their colleagues in an informal way. One of the critical aspects to building trust in working relationships is that you're willing to take the time to get to know folks. So one of the best recommendations that I can have when you first start in an organization is take the time to get to know your immediate colleagues in it. And especially if you're coming in with other new hires, that is a great social support network. You can look at them and say, hey, do you have any idea what's going on? They can look at you and say no, and then you feel better about what's going on. But also taking the time to get to know your immediate supervisors, colleagues who have been there for longer, 
and genuinely sitting down and seeing them. So the best organizations that I've ever worked in are ones where we had social lunch options where you could go down and, and just grab a lunch with folks and you take them up on the opportunity. You know, go to a happy hour. It doesn't matter if you drink or not. Just go to the happy hour and get to know people. Take any opportunity that you can to get to know folks in those first six to 12 months that you're in an organization. Not only do you end up with a better social support system, but you also start to figure out the politics of the organization, who's going to be really helpful, what resources you have available to you beyond sort of the, the traditional organizational hierarchy. So this means, and especially for people who might be a little bit introverted or might even have a big network of their own family and friends, it means that you take that time and the extra time to spend with work colleagues to get to know folks a little bit. Now, on the other side of it, it's also important that your colleagues are welcoming and inclusive. So one of the things that I've found now that I am <clears throat> a little bit senior is that it's you see newcomers come into an organization and they'll hang back. So part of my responsibility now as someone who is a little bit senior, who has some authority in different organizations, what have you, is to make sure that I invite people along. If I see someone who is maybe sitting in their office and a bunch of folks are all going out, to invite them, to make sure that newcomers are invited to the social events, um, to include folks when you are simply doing things. Now, if they say no, that's no big deal. Or if they say, hey, not this time, but next time, you make note of that and you make sure that you invite them along. You create opportunities for them to get to know. And even if it's not outside of work, you can go visit them and see how things are getting on. That Those little kinds of acts of kindness actually go a long ways, but it's all part of the socialization process. And it's about making sure that people feel included and as the employee, that you go and, and do your bit too. It's very easy to sort of get holed up in your own world and especially when you're even trying to figure out how things go. But pay attention to both the formal and the informal opportunities to be socialized within your organization. The social aspect of it is critical. The second context for socialization are individual versus collective activities. So as I mentioned that you may come into an organization with a cohort of folks. On the collective side, it's a really good idea to try and get to know other people who are newcomers or relative newcomers, people who have started within the last year or so that you might get to know. So making sure that you join work groups are, are even like in, in university, the year cohorts, that's an important collective form of socialization because it gives you an opportunity to reflect your own experiences, to hear other people's experiences and try to sense make about the organization. So joining in with the collective group, whatever that collective group may be, is an important part of the context for socialization. And oftentimes people are given opportunities uh, for mentoring, for for new employee lunches, for social settings that actually are really built around building, uh, designed to build up those social interactions. The other side of this is the individual context for social socialization. What can and what opportunities are provided for you to work on your career development, to better understand your roles, and basically get stuck into the work that you're doing. So as much as I'm saying it's important to be involved, it's also really incumbent on the work and the task side of it that as an employee, you kind of jump in both feet. So from an individual level and a collective level, the organization should be providing you with the resources that you need. You ask a thousand questions and I, I'll tell you this, paperwork in any new organization and figuring out who to go to that is the most important bit. So on the 
individual side of socialization, just being able to figure out the network of people that you should be talking to and asking for help is critical. And by the way, this is why you're always nice to the administrative assistants. They are your best source of individual socialization because if you're nice to them, if you're pleasant, if you have a good chat with them, they will help you out because they're usually really, they are sources of, of organizational knowledge. And they're also the people who have the ears of the bosses. So if you read to them, that is not going to go well for your socialization process too. So it's both sides. So what do you do as an individual to make sure that you understand or are up to speed? And what can you do by joining in with collective processes as well? The final context for socialization is fixed versus variable. When you come into an organization, if it's in normal times, there will be a set set of exercises, a set set of circumstances, opportunities that you will always find. This is the formal socialization process. And especially when you're coming in under normal circumstances, there's a routine. And a lot of times the socialization process is as much about checking off boxes as it is anything else. So uh, I have started academic jobs and private sector jobs alike, where I literally was given a checklist of people to go talk to. This is the fixed context for, for socialization. So I had to go talk to HR, I had to go talk to my line manager, to this person, to that person, to finance, to retirement, to goodness knows, 15, 20 different people. The first week at work, is usually about going and talking to random folks, being introduced to about a hundred jillion people that you never are gonna remember their names, especially I'm terrible with names, and then trying to figure it all out from there. You get packets of information, you read through it, and that's part of it. But part of that also fixed process is seeing what opportunities exist for the individual and the collective and also the social interactions. That aside, there's also the variable components to it. This may be based on the situation. So for example, um, anyone who's come into university under the pandemic or anyone who's starting a new job under the pandemic, there are just gonna be different realities for the socialization than there would have ordinarily been. So what is the organization trying to do to compensate for that? If an organization has gone through a massive crisis or a restructuring, you may find things are different for that organization. And oftentimes people are trying to cope with in the organization how to bring new people in as effectively as possible. So when we're talking about the fixed and variable context for socialization, what seems quite normal and routine and what is based on it might be your role it might be the socioeconomic, political, disease com situation, but what is unique about the situation that you're coming into an organization in? And that's one way to try and figure out how to navigate the organization and really the organization's ability to, to support you at the, as you're socializing into it. The organizational socialization process can seem quite daunting because there's a lot of different process, different environments, different everything that we're talking about. But in terms of newcomer needs, if you're thinking about how a socialization process can and should be designed, and if you're a newcomer thinking about how you're entering into the process, there are two fundamental needs that every newcomer has. So when we're talking about how socialization processes should be designed, they should be designed around these two needs. The first is clear information. At the basic level, what an organization should be providing to every newcomer is information about the expectations, the norms, the roles, and the values in the organization. This will come informally and formally, it will come individually and collectively, and it will come in fixed and variable ways. But as much as possible, the organization should be thinking about these 
four classes of information that every newcomer needs. The more that there is ambiguity, the more frustration that newcomers will feel in the process. You, what you don't want to get into a situation of is six months down the road, still not really having a clue about what your job is about. That suggests that the organization will have failed in its process. You may be doing work every day, you may be getting on just fine, but fundamentally, if you don't get what the job is supposed to be, the organization's probably failed. The other critical need that every newcomer has is help in interpreting things that happen from the organization's perspective. So a lot of times there's a communication exchange that goes on where someone might say, if you're a newcomer, well, in my previous organizations, X, Y, and Z has happened. What you're really asking for is how, how is it done here? Is that the same? And so in terms of your colleagues, in terms of your bosses, there will be a conversation and a set of conversations that help you to interpret the events through the lens of that organization, through its values, through its expectations. When managers, when colleagues, and when newcomers don't engage in these kinds of conversations, it actually hurts the socialization process quite a bit because you don't get a sense of where are the gaps and what you've done before and what the organization is wanting now. So it is also a dual responsibility in that way. So these both in terms of formal and informal com contexts are really important, but the newcomer needs are pretty simple. You need information and you need help interpreting events. So let's get very practical in terms of our approaches to socialization. There is a huge body of literature that talks about one of the most important parts of the anticipatory socialization process and the initial encounters. It's what's called the realistic job preview. What this involves is from an organization side, providing accurate, both positive and negative, view of the relevant aspects of the job and of the organization. So just before you're starting an organization or as you're coming into an organization, this is actually a set of documents and also a set of conversations that you'll have with a, a number of different employees. This can happen on interviews in the first week. Um, it can happen through documentation as well. So let's walk through this process of the realistic job preview. First thing is that there is information given to new employees about what the job is about. What this means is that when everything is written down, everything is discussed, employees have much more realistic expectations, not only about the organization, but about how they're expected to interact and engage with it. So this makes it easier for new employees expectations to be met because if you haven't if you're coming into day one and you know what most days are going to look like what kinds of tasks you're going to be performing the likeliness of you being in meetings whatever the make case may be you're set up and you have less uncertainty you know what you're meant to be doing. This leads to very specific outcomes. So when we're talking about the outcomes of a good socialization process, being able to meet the new employee's expectations leads to better satisfaction and motivation, better productivity and commitment, and also leads to less voluntary turnover. So the process is actually pretty simple. It's about good documentation and about spelling things out ahead of time making people feel more certain about the environment that they're walking into. Now, of course, that we still have the interpersonal components fitting into teams, all of that. But if the core job in and of itself is concrete, tangible, and people know what they're talking about, that meets the requirements for the realistic job preview. Like I said, there's about 15, 20 years worth of detailed research that highlights these factors that simply giving people good information about the functional part of their job ahead of time and making them feel prepared and like they that they know what kinds of expectations they're going to have, it leads very effectively to these 
outcomes, the satisfaction and motivation, productivity and commitment, and reduced turnover. When building an effective organizational socialization program, we begin with the anticipatory socialization stage and the realistic preview. Then we move into employee orientation programs. So this encompasses that second stage or the initial encounters. So that can last up to six to 12 months for people as they're getting into job programs. And so this takes the realistic job preview and then makes sure that it's that it's implemented as people are getting used to the various parts of their job. So employee orientation programs are designed to provide information about the organization, the job, things like the overview of the company, the mission statement, strategies, compensation, employee relations, and the facilities. You get that typically as you start. It's not so much the same as the realistic job preview as it is walking through your rights, your responsibilities, and how the company is actually functioning. But then it's also helping you get to know the department functions, the duties and responsibilities, policies, rules, introductions, and introduction into the work groups. Now, this isn't something that just happens in the first week. This is something that can go on on an ongoing basis for that orientation period. In most organizations, you get a six or a 12 month or six and 12 month review of your performance. And through that time, organizations are actually meant to be supporting individuals and supporting their new employees. So the, there are a lot of different ways that employee orientation programs can be implemented. They could be done with mentoring programs. They could be making sure that people have contacts that check in with them in terms of, of the types of information, the types of forms, the policies, all that kind of thing. So there are different kinds of checkpoints that different organizations take in terms of the orientation. Some actually have um, a bit of a class that's associated with it. So once a week you go and you get more details, you're treated as an associate for a period of time so that you can get to know the job and you can get to know the job function. You might even work under somebody as their apprentice for a short period of time. All of this is part of an orientation program. The industry will affect how this is done. The particular organization will affect how it's done. But it's one of the things that during interview processes, it's actually good to ask about what kind of an employee orientation program that an organization has, because that gives you a good indication about how new employees might be supported over their initial review process. What the research has consistently found in the last 30 to 40 years is that good, well-supported employee orientation programs lead to a lot of positive outcomes for organizations. First, for the employee, of course, they reduce stress, but it also reduces startup costs. What they allow is for employees to be embedded within the organization more effectively, to get up to speed more effectively, and so the actual cost for investment in the program is made up in terms of how effectively and how efficiently a new employee catches up. Most importantly, in a lot of organizations, it reduces turnover. The cost for recruitment and hiring processes isn't cheap. When organizations can retain employees, it is simply good business. The amount of money that that saves for organizations is actually in the hundreds of millions, if you think across organizations, across industries, every single year. Recruitment is one of the most expensive things organizations can do. So investment in a good orientation program is actually a cost savings for most organizations. So because of that reduction of stress, reduction of cost, it also expedites the proficiency of newcomers to help them be assimilated into the organization, to know how to respond, to know where to go, and enhances the adjustment to all the norms. Generally speaking, it's about creating a positive work environment. So when we're thinking about organizational culture, we should 
be also thinking about how is it that people are socialized into this organization so that they understand both their task functions as well as their relational functions within the organization. Now, these are themes that we're going to come back to throughout the course of this of the semester and throughout our exploration of employee engagement and employee communication. But this helps to set the tone for what we should expect of a good organization, a good strong organizational culture and the positive outcomes of that, and more specifically, how an organization should treat its newcomers and ensure that they're successful to make sure that the organization is successful.